Today on the John Ankerberg Show, what is the main reason for the fact that the early Christians believed Jesus rose from the dead and is alive today and could give you eternal life when you die? It was because after he was dead and buried, they actually saw Jesus alive, touched him, and talked with him. They didn't believe on Jesus just because he said he was the Son of God, but because they saw him alive after he was crucified. This proved to them that his teachings were true. For example, if you're a university student and are told your dad just had a heart attack and died, you'd rush home and a few days later go to his funeral. After the funeral, what if one day you are shopping at Walmart and turn to the next aisle and suddenly you see your dad standing there. In your amazement, you say, Dad? And he turns around and says, How are you doing, son? You go over and shake his hand and give him a hug. Three of your friends who attended the funeral also see your dad standing there and come over and shake his hand and talk to him. In fact, 15 other people who were at the funeral also meet you and your dad at Walmart. What would you all conclude? You would believe that somehow your dad who had died is now alive. Why? Because you saw him, touched him, and talked to him. You would never forget the fact that you saw him alive after he was dead. This is the kind of eyewitness evidence that the Christian faith is based on. Individuals, the 11 apostles, family members, over 500 people at one time, all testified that they saw, talked, and touched Jesus after he was crucified, buried, and then appeared to them. The consensus position among scholars today is this historical evidence about Jesus was written down and in circulation among Christians within at least two years or possibly even weeks of Jesus' crucifixion. Today, world-class philosopher Dr. Gary Habermas will present this historical evidence. He received his PhD from Michigan State University and a second doctorate from Emmanuel College in Oxford, England. Dr. Habermas is chairman of the Department of Philosophy and Theology at Liberty University and has written more than 100 articles on the life of Jesus in scholarly journals. To hear the historical evidence for Jesus' resurrection, we invite you to join us for this edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and my guest today is philosopher Dr. Gary Habermas. Now, if you're a skeptic, I have a question for you. You probably believe that there's very little historical evidence available to provide a very strong basis for traditional Christian beliefs about Jesus, specifically that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and appeared to his followers. You say, I just don't believe that. Well, my guest today was working on his PhD at Michigan State University and was just as skeptical as you are. But in his research, he was confronted with 12 historical facts that stopped him and showed that he was wrong. In fact, these historical facts pulled him across the line from being a skeptic to becoming a Christian. And he talks about the persuasiveness of some of the facts that he discovered. You need to listen to this. Last program we ended with about a half dozen facts that I said, based on this material alone, we can argue that Jesus died and that he appeared after his death. Just a personal note, the reason I think these facts are so important, at least in my life, is because I spent, spent 10 years as a, a skeptic. I argued with Christians, actually argued with anybody who claimed to be religious at all. It might be a Jehovah's Witness, it might be a Mormon, but many times it was a Christian. And I kept rejecting their factual bases. I kept saying, you don't have data for that, that's in the Gospels, you don't have data for this, you don't have data for that. I'd study religion, state university, and, and I thought that way. And what these four facts say to me is, we can reduce our list if you want, and Christians have a right to believe the Gospels and so on. But for those who reject that, we, we need just a small basis, in fact, 
to show that the naturalistic theories have failed and that Christ has been raised from the dead. And I think that's what these half dozen facts do. Basically, here's what we're doing. We're, we're playing the method here the way the critics do, thinking the way they think, and saying even treating the Bible is no more than an ancient book of literature. I mean, you know, how can it be less than that? It's ancient. It's got pages in it, and there's words on the pages. I mean, that's pretty basic. And treating, treating the Bible as a book of ancient literature, you still come up with these core or minimal facts, as I call them, and on this basis alone, we can refute the naturalistic theories and argue that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, I asked Dr. Habermast to specifically tell me the facts that really got to him. And here's what he told me. Now, the very first fact on this list is that Jesus died. Why do scholars today rarely question the death of Jesus? Why do the founders of the Jesus Seminar, for example, those who've written on the subject, why do uh, John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg say that the fact that Jesus died is the surest fact we have in his career because the data are so strong? Now, what are some of those? First of all, Death by crucifixion is essentially death by asphyxiation. When you hang on the cross and the weight of your body pulls down on the intercostal pectoral, pectoral and deltoid muscles around your lungs, you reach a state where when the weight's dragging down on them, you can inhale, but you are increasingly unable to exhale until you reach a, a place of almost paralysis and you can't exhale at all. Actually, in the 1950s, an experiment was done in West Germany where male volunteers were asked to be tied to a two-by-four. These males lost consciousness in a maximum of 12 minutes. Now, on the cross, you can push up, if only on the nails or whatever. You can push up, and when you push up, you relieve those muscles in your lungs. But when you pull down on them again, because you can't stay up there for long, you pull down, and when you're in the low position on the cross, you asphyxiate. The Roman historian did not have to have a degree in medicine. If the person's hanging low on the cross for any amount of time, let's say 30 minutes, he's dead. Second, we're told that they stabbed Jesus in the chest and blood and water came out. Someone says, well, that's in the Gospel of John and we're not going to give that to you. Let me tell you something. In the ancient crucifixion accounts, there are a number of accounts of a coup de gras, a crushing blow that's done at the end of crucifixion to end the account. We have an account of a man whose skull was crushed to finish the process, a man who was threatened with a bow and arrow. We have two other cases outside of Jesus in the Gospel of John where he was stabbed to make sure he was dead. And of course, we have what is known as crucifragrium in Latin the break into the ankles so the person cannot push back up again. In all these cases, here's what the executioner is saying. You're not getting down alive. So reason number one, you're low on the cross, dead. You've asphyxiated. Number two, death blow. In the case of Jesus, we're told that it was a spear wound in the chest. In the Journal uh, of the American Medical Association just about 15 years ago, we were told that Jesus' death came from asphyxiation. They, the researchers said, including the pathologist from Mayo Clinic, they said that the spear entered his heart and the water, how do you know? The water came from the sac surrounding the heart called the pericardium. So Jesus was dead. But if he wasn't, the death blow would have done it. Third reason. Now this gets a little bit gory and maybe you're thinking, well, what have you done so far? But, but the third thing is called sucking chest. It's a very well-known medical phenomenon. If you're stabbed, through the upper thoracic area and it goes through the lung. A living person, if you're alive, there will be a sucking sound that comes through that hole. And guess what? You don't have to be a medical doctor to know that if you're making that sound, you're alive. I had a student tell me just today that he shot a deer. And when he walked up to him, he had shot it through the chest that was making that noise and he put his gun up to shoot it again and the noise stopped. The animal died. So if he was stabbed in the chest and it didn't go through the heart, we would know because of the sucking chest syndrome. So these are some of the reasons to believe that crucifixion is lethal. Asphyxiation, heart wound, and if it only went through the chest, you'd have the sucking chest. Now, having said these things, this is not, none of these are the historical reason, the chief reason for believing that Jesus did not fake death. In 1835, a German liberal named David Strauss, he wrote A Life of Jesus, and he was so liberal that he was pensioned off from his very liberal university and told to 
to just quit teaching. He was pensioned off for life because of his highly critical view of Jesus. But here's what he says in that famous writing, what, criticizing those who believe that Jesus didn't die. And by the way, that was the most popular theory up until 1835, that Jesus didn't die. He said, here's the problem with the swoon theory. It's basically self-contradictory. Jesus should have died on the cross. Don't worry about it, he didn't. Should have died in the tomb. Don't worry about it, he didn't. Wouldn't have been able to roll the stone away. Took several men. You'd be rolling the stone uphill out of the little gully in front of the tomb. He was in weak condition. Don't worry about it. He rolled the stone away. Walked how long? I don't know. Quarter mile? Blocks? To where the disciples are? On feet that were pierced by nails. And Strauss said, you think all of these are problems? It's not the chief problem. Here's the chief problem with saying Jesus didn't die. He comes to the door where the disciples are. And when, he come, when they open the door, what's he going to look like? What's he looking like? He's pale. He's sweating. The side wounds opened up again. He's hunched over. He's not even washed his hair. Sweat, blood have caked his hair. He's limping. And he says, fellas, I told you I would rise again from the dead. Strauss says, watch what happens here. He's alive, yes. Raised, no. Here's what they would do. Peter, give him your chair. Andrew, go get some water. John, go get a doctor. They'd say, thank the Lord he was healed, or he's getting healed, or he's alive. But they wouldn't say, thank the Lord he's going to be raised. And so don't expect to see Philip over in the corner saying, as the New Testament says, oh boy, someday I'm going to have a resurrection body just like his. No thanks. Thanks. I will keep the body I have. Let Jesus keep the body he has. Now that's Strauss's point. Here's what Swoon says, and we often miss this. Alive, yes. Raised, no. What's the problem? If the disciples don't at least believe he's raised, you have no cause for the New Testament church, no cause for early preaching. They have to at least believe he's been raised. The swoon theory doesn't give that to you. Conclusion, asphyxiation, heart, chest, Strauss's critique. We've got many other problems. What do you do with Paul? What do you do with James? How are they convinced to join the crowd here? The conclusion, assuredly, is that Jesus died on the cross due to Roman crucifixion. Now, folks, a few years ago, I once took a cruise, and one day I looked up and everybody was sitting on the deck, and they were reading the same book. And for some reason, they were all reading Hugh Schoenfield's best-selling book called The Passover Plot. Do you ever remember reading that book? Well, it claimed that Jesus was given drugs while on the cross and just appeared to die, but he really didn't die. So I asked Dr. Habermas about this book, and here's his response. Now what happens when we apply this to a book, like the Passover plot? The author suggested that Jesus did not die on the cross. And by the way, a lot of people don't remember this, but he said, this is only a suggestion. I'm not saying this really happened. But he said, what if Jesus didn't die on the cross? Well, he runs up against asphyxiation. He runs up against heart. He runs up against chest. He runs up against Strauss's critique. And so the swoon theory in the Passover plot was largely ignored by critics. In fact, it got put on a lot of lists by scholars that, uh, you know, don't take this as our work. Because the point is, you can't rule out this material in that manner. In fact, let me tell you this. After David Strauss's critique in 1835, Albert Schweitzer's famous book on the quest of the historical Jesus, he lists no scholars who hold the swoon theory after 1840. Historically speaking, Strauss's critique alone, if you'll pardon the pun, Strauss's critique alone killed the swoon theory. Now, if you just tuned in, Dr. Gary Habermas, a philosopher, is laying out 12 historical facts that are accepted by virtually all critical scholars around the world today. The importance of these 12 historical facts is that they form a solid historical foundation for traditional Christian beliefs about Jesus, and they repudiate the Jesus Seminar and other liberals and shoot down all naturalistic explanations which have attempted to explain away Jesus' resurrection. Now, the next fact we're going to look at is this. Jesus was buried. Why is this fact so important? Listen. Now, for the believer for whom the death and resurrection of Jesus are crucially important, as Paul says, of first importance, where do we go next? Jesus died on the cross, as by the way even the Talmud tells us, and then we're told he's buried. 
Now, this is not questioned by a lot of people. I mean, it's a pretty normal event. People who die are buried. But what is there to say in favor of the burial accounts as we learn of them in the New Testament? First of all, although today critics are not so inclined to take the Gospels as they are to take Paul, let's just make the comment that all four Gospels are agreed that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was empty. All right. The critic responds, I don't like the Gospels. But let's point out, number two, just because the critic doesn't like the Gospels, that does not explain the Gospels away. What you need, number two, is evidence that he was buried somewhere else. And that's the key, evidence that he was buried somewhere else. There are no takers, really. You know why? There's no evidence that he was buried anywhere else. You can say, maybe this, maybe that. But let's ask the unbeliever for the same question, same type of data the Christian has asked for. Where's your data to say that he wasn't buried, just like the gospel said? Number three, a lot of folks have made the point that Joseph and Nicodemus, their names are difficult to explain in those burial uh, stories unless they were the guys that did the burial. Why bring these names out of obscurity if they weren't really the people? It makes sense of somebody who believes they're telling the right story. Continuing, we have a few early texts. Now, we've mentioned these before, creeds. 1 Corinthians 15, remember the triple ho T and, and, and argument. Paul says, he died for our sins according to the scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised, and he appeared. Now follow that sequence in this very early non-Pauline, pre-Pauline text. If somebody is dead, buried, raised, and appeared, the strong implication is the one that went down is the one that came up. You've got Paul saying there was a burial, but he's going to go further than that. We'll save that for a comment on the empty tomb. But, but the 1 Corinthians 15 passage says, buried, and there, you, uh, there again you've got that early evidence. Another good argument is Acts 13.29. Why? Because some critical scholars are willing to grant that, as I said earlier, Acts 13 contains another of those little creedal passages, the abbreviated theology. And there in Acts 13.29, in this passage, we're told that he was buried. So there's a, there are two textual, two early textual arguments. You've got uh, the Gospels, no evidence against Joseph and Nicodemus. You've got 1 Corinthians 15, Acts 13. And lastly, Jerusalem is the last place you want to proclaim the burial if it's not been buried there because that's the place, the only place in the world that can be refuted. They can grab the body, they can say, no, he's not here, he's over here. Jerusalem's the last place to make that claim. So there's a half dozen arguments to believe that what the Gospels say about burial and what Paul says at a very early date about burial is indeed true. The next fact that we want to look at is the empty tomb. This too is a fact of history, and it leads to the question, what happened to Jesus' body? Where was he? Dr. Habermas explains. Okay, let's move on to the next step. He died. He was buried. What happened in that tomb? Well, the Christian story is that he was raised, but in between burial and raising, we're told the tomb was vacated. Jesus is leaving, left it alone. Is there any reason to believe that? Again, one of the first points we want to say is, all four Gospels record the empty tomb. And here comes the critics. I told you, I don't like the Gospels. What do we have to back up those early Gospel stories of the empty tomb? Let me give you three big evidences right off the bat. One is that the earliest witnesses to the empty tomb are women. Why is that important? Because if you're making up the story, remember our mo Monday morning quarterbacking scenario. If you're making up a story, putting the words back into the mouths of the earliest Christians sometime later, don't use women for your first witnesses. Why? In the first century, they were not allowed to testify in a court of law. They were not to, believed to be able to tell the truth. We're actually told that. They couldn't testify. So why do you take people who can't go on the witness stand, it would be like making your chief witnesses little children, why do you say, there they are, the tomb's empty, the women saw him, unless, in fact, the women found the empty tomb first? Okay, second reason, the Jews believe the tomb was empty. Now there's a fact in history, there's a method in history rather, that says when your critic admits something, most likely it's correct. If, if you can't stand somebody and you say he's this and that and this and that and this and that, but he is a brave person, chances are 
he's a brave person. And the disciples said, the tomb is empty. Now they thought the disciples stole the body. And nobody, virtually no reputable scholars, held that theory for over 200 years because liars don't make martyrs. You have no explanation for disciples' transformation and their honest belief. If they stole the body and lied, you have no explanation for James. You have no explanation for Paul. So that explanation does not make a lot of sense. But what are you left with? If the disciples stole the body, according to the Jews, but that theory doesn't really work, what you have is an empty tomb. What it seems like is that the Jewish leaders are making something up to, or making an explanation, to explain a fact. The body's gone. Third argument. You have that early text I gave you a moment ago, 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul's sequence again is, died for our sins, buried, raised, appeared. Now when the same person dies, buried, raised, and appears, guess what? The body's not there. What's gone down has come up. And there's a strong implication in 1 Corinthians 15. You have an overt statement of the burial, and you have a strong implication of the next step, the empty tomb. We can throw some other things in here, as I said. Again, Jerusalem, just like the burial, Jerusalem is the last place to proclaim the empty tomb, because people could say, ah, boys, the tomb's not empty, and they can take you right back there. Acts 13, 29, another early creedal passage, says he was buried and the tomb was empty. So here's another half dozen arguments, but especially I like the women, I like the Jewish admittance of the empty tomb, and I like Paul's creed in 1 Corinthians 15. It's three real tough arguments that say, you know what the gospel said? They have the ring of truth regarding the empty tomb. Now, we've looked at three historical facts about Jesus today. First, that he actually did die from crucifixion on the cross. Second, he was buried. And third, his tomb was found empty on the third day. Next week, we're going to examine the fact that all of Jesus' disciples believed that Jesus had appeared to them, and they saw him after they had seen him crucified and buried. What explains this fact? Group hallucinations, visions, or that Jesus really appeared to them? We'll answer those questions next week. But now, Dr. Habermas summarizes what we've seen today and its importance to you. Where are we going with all this? First I said, the critics will give you probably a couple dozen facts. I've said, that's okay, I only want 12. For those who think 12 is too many, and believe me, that's very few of the published authors who deal with this, I'll just give you four. And I said that basis alone shows us that the one who died is the one who was raised. Now in between these two events, we have a burial and an empty tomb. I gave you about a half dozen reasons to believe both. The thing we haven't said anything about yet is the appearances. And this is the, the chief evidence by far. And the reason is because the critical community is willing to admit that the disciples really thought they saw the risen Jesus. And this is the best evidence for the resurrection of all of them. Well, thanks for joining me today. In these programs, I wanted you to hear and know the evidence to share with a friend who wants to know why you believe Jesus rose from the dead and appeared to many people around Jerusalem. Please remember the words that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. These words were an early creedal statement or a short set of essential beliefs that were easy for illiterate Jewish people to remember. Now Paul says he received this creed from others and was passing it along to the church at Corinth. Big question is, when did Paul receive this creed? First, this creed could have been in circulation among Christians before Paul saw the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus only two years after the crucifixion in 32 AD. Those who cared for him might have given it to him right after he saw Jesus. Or second, Paul might have heard these beliefs from Christians as he was hunting them down and persecuting them. Or third, Paul could have received this information in 35 AD when he went up to Jerusalem and met with Peter and James in person around 35 AD. This information was in circulation before that meeting. In addition, these men were eyewitnesses of Jesus' appearances to them. Then I want you to look carefully at the facts in this creed that Paul says were of first importance for Christians to believe. In the creed, we find four 
key points about Jesus. First, we see from very early on, Jesus was identified as deity because he was called the Christ. The word Christ means Messiah. We're also told that Jesus was dead, he was buried, and he rose from the dead, and then made appearances to hundreds of people in all kinds of places and different situations. This information has caused the majority of critical scholars worldwide to acknowledge that Jesus' resurrection was known very early among Christians, and it might even have come from the very people who were in Jerusalem when the resurrection events themselves happened. If you would like to have all the evidence that is presented in our six programs with Dr. Gary Habermas, we are making all six TV programs available on two DVDs for a gift of $60. And you may order them by calling us now at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or you may immediately download all six TV programs for $30 at our website at jashow.org. That's jashow.org. In addition, we are making available our devotional booklet entitled, Of First Importance, 30 Days of Devotions from 1 Corinthians 15. It's in print or as a download for any gift you give in support of our ministry. And if you live in Canada, you may call and order our two DVDs and the devotional book at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. Or you may download all six TV programs at our Canadian website at jashow.ca. And I'll appreciate your help very much. Next week on The John Ankerberg Show. Disciples were not only claiming, I believe his claims that he's the son of God. I believe God vindicated him by raising him. I believe he was raised. Some of these claims don't sound a lot different on the surface than what other people have, been, have believed, but the disciples added something else. I saw you, I touched you, it was a mundane experience. When you appeared, I was shocked, but once you appeared, the Gospels say he ate, he walked, he cooked a shore lunch. I mean, he's doing normal things. Our goal is to present the evidence for the Gospel worldwide and to encourage Christians in their walk with the Lord. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.